Greetings. This is a uh, video lecture on aesthetic reasoning for my critical thinking class. Uh, it's in the module on aesthetic reasoning, but this particular set of notes is a little newer. Um, I basically just uh, completed that. And um, it is on aesthetic reasoning and judgments of beauty. So uh, we have aesthetic reasoning and judgments on art and the value of art. Uh, but this is related but distinct and it's judgments of beauty. So having started with that, I am going to share my screen. Here we are. So aesthetic reasoning, judgments of beauty. So generally speaking, uh, we're gonna look at three possible approaches you can take uh, to how you regard judgments of beauty, how one regards judgments of beauty. Um, when I make the claim that some object is beautiful, what sort of claim am I making? Am I saying something which is objectively true or false? And we, we've talked about objectivity and subjectivity with respect to claims earlier in this course. We actually started very early with that. Uh, or am I saying something subjective, uh, basically reporting a personal, private, inner experience? Or is there some third possibility? And that's what I want to spend a little bit of time examining uh, in these set of notes. We're going to be uh, looking at each of these. But before I do, I want to consider a uh, related or at least a similar question. Um, when I claim that an object is obscene, what am I claiming? I think some of the um, challenges uh, making out the answer to that question uh, and what is it to make, how to make sense of judgments of obscenity, I think some of those same challenges um, are presented for those who are trying to make out what it makes to what, what we're doing when we make claims about beauty and judgments about beauty. I think that our understanding of objectivity, subjectivity, and what I call the ideal observer theory with respect to obscenity will assist us in understanding these very same concepts with respect to judgments of beauty. So we're going to postpone our look at beauty and first talk about obscenity. Um, what does it mean to say that something is obscene? Again, is one making an objective claim about the object itself, right? Am I saying something which is objectively true or objectively false? Or is it merely a claim about one's own personal reactions? So is this some sort of subjective report? I'm telling you about some subjective experience I'm having. Um, I'm, I'm having the obscene reaction when I look at that image or when I hear that word or something like that? Or is something else going on? Is there a third possibility? Here I want to quickly outline four distinct possibilities. First, objectivism. According to this view, obscenity names a mind-independent property. Things either are obscene or they are not, and this is so regardless of how or if any individuals react or would react to the object. In other words, whether anyone thinks the object is obscene or not, it is. So if I say that that object is five pounds, well, this is an objective fact about the object. It either is five pounds and it, or it is not five pounds. And whether anyone believes it to be five pounds or not is irrelevant to the question of whether it is in fact five pounds or not. On that view of obscenity, whether anyone finds that image or that gesture or that word obscene uh, is irrelevant to the question of whether it is in fact obscene. Now that's if one's taking the objectivist point of view. Again, if two individuals disagree about whether something is obscene or not, one of them must be wrong and the other must be right because according to this view, they are disagreeing about some objective state of affairs. So just, if two, just as if two individuals disagreed about whether an object is five pounds or not, they can't both be correct. Either it is five pounds or it is not. Now, subjectivism, according to this view of obscenity, obscenity names a private mind-dependent sensation or reaction. This view holds that obscenity is, in a sense, in the eye of the beholder. Hence, it is the view that when I claim that something is obscene, I'm only reporting my personal reaction to it. According to this view, it is quite possible for one and the same thing to be obscene 
for me, that is causing me the obscene reaction, but not to be obscene in you. In other words, it doesn't cause that reaction in you. For it merely is, uh, we're merely reacting to the object differently. For that matter, it's entirely possible that the very same object be obscene for me one day and not be obscene for me the next day. I might regard it as obscene. It may provoke in me the obscene experience uh, on Monday, and then on Tuesday, somehow I've gotten used to it, and I don't find it nearly as obscene as perhaps once I did. But a third possibility would be the ideal observer theory. <clears throat> now, we very briefly discussed ideal observer theory when we looked at alternatives to positivism earlier in this course, but now I'm going to flesh this out a little bit more. Um, it also is relevant to um, moral reasoning, um, and as we'll see, it's going to be relevant to legal reasoning going forward. But right now, ob ideal observer theory is the view that obscenity maintains that, to, uh, let's try that again, the ideal observer theory as applied to judgments of obscenity maintains that to say that something is obscene is not to report one's own personal responses to the object, nor is it to claim that the thing possesses some sort of mind independent objective property, but rather it is to predict the subjective responses of most normal people. According to this view, to say that an image or an object is obscene is to say that most sensitive, unbiased, informed persons would have the obscene reaction to it. So notice this view sort of blends objective and subjective elements. It is talking about the subjective responses of certain observers, but not all observers' responses are equally relevant to the question of obscenity. The only re objective response the only subjective responses that are relevant to judgments of obscenity are the subjective responses of a certain class of observers. In this case, what we're calling ideal judges or ideal observers. We'll talk more about that in a moment. However, there's a fourth variant of that, which uh, a fourth possibility, which is a variant of the ideal observer theory, which I'm gonna call ideal observer theory plus context. Um, and this is the same as the above, but it acknowledges that the subjective reactions of objects, even among ideal observers, uh, are predicated in part on the context of that interaction, the meaning, the expectations, the environment, et cetera. This view is mindful of the fact that even ideally situated judges may react to the very same word, image, or object differently given a different context. Um, I recall many years ago when I was a young uh, adjunct professor and I was teaching at the University of Miami and it was in this rather large auditorium and I was teaching a course on contemporary ethical issues like a course we have here. And we were doing a module on pornography. And in those days, I had students doing presentations in my classes. I learned that's not always a good idea. So I had a group of students, each group had their own topic they would do, and it was a group of students and their topic for that day was obscenity and pornography. So before they began their presentation to the class, they passed out fly, um, handouts to the entire class, right? And we all got these, you know, uh, Xeroxed papers or whatnot. And on these papers were very graphic sexual images. It was couples involved in all sorts of sexual activities of a variety of kinds, some rather imaginative couplings. And I remember becoming quite, I don't know, uh, flushed and, and finding myself a little, uh, you know, uh, offended by some of these images that I was being presented with, right? And then as they began their presentation, they said each and every one of these images came from a Masters and Johnson study on human sexuality. And like that, those very same images that at one point was making me feel a little embarrassed and, and, and uh, out of sorts, all of a sudden they just became clinical. So that's my point about context, right? My reaction very much changed because the context, the set of expectations, et cetera, uh, within which I was viewing those images changed. Right? So ideal observer theory plus context. 
All right, so a little bit more detail on the ideal observer theory. I mentioned it, as I said, briefly in uh, my notes on alternatives to logical positivism, but now I want to go into a little bit more detail. As mentioned already, it's an alternative to both objectivism and subjectivism with respect to judgments of obscenity. With regard to obscenity, for instance, the ideal observer theory is not claiming that there is some objective fact in the world such that objects are objectively obscene or innocent. In this sense, the ideal observer theory agrees with the subjectivist. On the other hand, unlike the subjectivist, the ideal observer theory is claiming that when I assert X is obscene, I'm saying something more than I personally find X obscene. In this sense, um, indeed, I am making a, an objective claim about the world. And in a sense, uh, the theory, the ideal observer theory has something in common with the objectivist. Right? So you see it's sort of splitting the difference between the two. However, the objective fact that one is asserting when one claims that X is obscene is not in fact an objective fact about X. Rather, it's an objective fact about the subjective reactions of a certain class of observers. So that even though the sentence is, that is obscene, right? That photo is obscene. It's not actually a claim about the photo. It's a claim about the subjective responses of a certain class of observers to the photo. So it's not a property of the photo that makes the photo obscene so much as it is, as it is a kind of reaction the photo provokes in certain observers. In the same way, when I say seawater is salty, I mean to say that seawater is such as to provoke a salty taste in the experience of normal human perceivers when they taste it. Here too, I'm making an objective claim about the world. Likewise, when I say that stop signs are red or ambulance sirens are very loud, I'm making true objective claims. But notice, what are those true objective claims about? Are they actually about the sirens or the signs? Or are they about a certain class of observers and the kinds of reactions those observers might have to the signs or to the sirens? So if you poke at these a bit, you will see that they are not claims about stop signs and sirens. Rather, they are claims about the subjective reactions of human observers when those observers perceive stop signs and sirens. We may have to further modify this uh, because it's claims about those subject, subjective reactions to ideal human observers, ideal human observers, not colorblind, human observers, not deaf human observers, and under certain observation conditions, like for instance, under normal light uh, and not under, uh, not in complete darkness or something like that. This uh, is standardly done in science. When I claim that an object or a chemical exhibits certain observable features, sometimes it's quite explicit and sometimes it's more implicit. But for instance, when gemologists will tell you that all emeralds are green, what do they mean by that? All emeralds are such as to provoke a green sensation in suitable, uh, ideally uh, situated uh, human observers under certain observational conditions. Right? They may not appear green to individuals with difficulty perceiving color or, or visual problems. They may not appear green under certain uh, odd forms of light. Uh, so again, I am making an objective claim when I say that all emeralds are green. And the grammar looks like I am predicating a certain property, greenness, of a certain subject, emerald. But that's the grammar, right? As we saw earlier, sometimes the grammar can be misleading. I mean, if I were going to diagram that sentences, right? Emeralds all are, uh, emeralds all uh, are, uh, and then predicate adjective green, right? And yet, when we poke at it, we see that the grammar is doing one thing, but the linguistic work is actually a little bit different, right? Scientists must always relativize sets of, obser uh, of observers and 
Let's try that again. Scientists must always relativize to a set of observers and a set of observing conditions. Notice dog whistles are not silent to dogs, but they're silent to us. So if I said, are dog, dog whistles silent? I'd have to further specify under what conditions and to what set of observers. I recall a number of years ago, the Miami City uh, Commission uh, brought in a outside marketing agency to help Miami promote uh, itself as a tourism destination. Among other things, this agency developed posters and flyers and all sorts of promotional material for Miami. One city commissioner objected vociferously to a particular photograph included in the portfolio on the grounds that this photograph was obscene. And we can't have this as part of our promotional material, it's obscene. However, this was not because this photo displayed, let's say, scantily clad South Beachers or some such, but rather it was the photograph of a plate of vegetables. Nevertheless, the commissioner insisted that the vegetables were arranged in such a way and so suggestively that it was obscene. Now, no doubt this commissioner was indeed having an obscene reaction to the photograph, I'm not challenging that. However, it seems to me that that alone is not enough to deem the photograph as indeed obscene. In this case, I believe that this particular commissioner was simply being too sensitive. On the other hand, if somebody told me that they saw nothing particularly wrong with a certain sexually explicit or graphically violent images, I might suggest that that individual was not sensitive enough. But if one claims that a person can be too sensitive or not sensitive enough, one has already admitted that there is some sort of ideal. And when we deem something as obscene or not, we do not mean that it is offensive to the overly sensitive or that it's unoffensive to the insufficiently sensitive. Rather, we would seem to be claiming that it would provoke the obscene reaction in most normal, sensitive, informed, and impartial judges. In other words, it would serve to provoke the, uh, the obscene reaction in ideal observers. And this is the nature of the ideal observer theory. In addition to using ideal observer theory in terms of cashing out what we mean when we make judgments of obscenity, it is often common uh, to use the same in judgments of what is and is not sexual harassment. It's not that certain words in all contexts are considered sexually harassing, nor is it the case that anyone who genuinely feels sexually harassed has unimpeachable evidence that sexual harassment did in fact take place. Here again, there might be individuals who are too sensitive or for that matter, not sensitive enough. Also note that when juries are told to determine whether or not the prosecution has proven its case beyond a reasonable doubt, what does this mean? It means would a reasonable person still have doubts about the guilt of the accused after having canvassed all of the facts and arguments and evidence? Here again, we seem to be trading on the ideal observer theory. In other words, you're asking, would a normal, sensitive, informed, and impartial, rational individual still have a doubt? Notice the ideal observer theory with regard to obscenity provides us with kind of an empirical test as to what and what is not obscene. Presumably, we would simply put a bunch of these ideal observers in a room and start showing them images. If all or most agreed that the image was obscene, that is, that they have the obscene reaction in response to the image, then the object is obscene. If all or most fail to have the obscene reaction, then the object is not obscene. And if there is no general consensus, then the object seems to be neither obscene Per, but perhaps not fully innocent either. But this is because, according to this view, all we mean by saying that an object is obscene is to say that is such as to provoke the obscene reaction in just such a group of observers. 
Now, as useful as the ideal observer theory is, and in fact, uh, I do think it is useful, uh, and we use it all the time, it suffers from some serious shortcomings. For instance, how old is the ideal observer? Or what gender is the ideal observer? Or what sexual orientation, socioeconomic background, race, ethnicity, what religious affiliation? Of course, these are rhetorical questions I raise to make the point that what does uh, what one does and what one does not find obscene, for instance, uh, may have a great deal to do with what they've become accustomed to or these other features I've mentioned before, right? Your life history, et cetera, who you are and how you came to be who you are right now. Consider, in, uh, in order to conduct our imagined research project of putting a bunch of ideal observers in a room, we would have to determine who we would and whom we would not allow in the room. Now, you might say that individuals whose sense of obscenity was affected by their religious affiliations are not sufficiently impartial, and therefore we wouldn't allow them in the room. So in other words, if you're um, your sense of obscenity has been affected by uh, your religious background, well, then that, that would rule you out. We couldn't have you as one of our participants. But the same might be said by people whose sense of obscenity is affected by their age or by their gender or by their sexual orientation or by their race or by their socioeconomic background. You see my point. But is that realistic? Once sufficiently screened of all their prejudices uh, or prejudicing influences, what, if anything, would determine these observers' reactions, if not their race or their social economic background or their ethnicity or uh, their gender, et cetera? Further, we would seem to be conceptually constructing a non existing human being some genderless, raceless, religionless, ageless, ahistorical creature. And heaven only knows what the subject of reactions of that sort of being would be. Aside from being fictitious, I suppose. Given the difficulties presented by the ideal observer theory, how old is the ideal observer? As a practical matter, we have relegated these questions to community standards. After all, the subjective responses of the normal, sensitive, informed, impartial Kendallite might be significantly different from the normal, sensitive, informed, unbiased Hylian or South Beecher or Pensacolian, etc. In the US, we have developed what's called the Miller test as a matter of law, as a means to sort out obscene and therefore unprotected free speech from pre, uh, free speech uh, protected by the US Constitution. The Miller test coming from Miller versus California, 1973. In Miller, it was, there was established a new constitutional test for obscenity, which remains the governing standard today. The three criteria of this test are as follows. One, whether the average person applying contemporary community standards would find that the work taken as a whole appeals to prurient interests, where prurient interests are understood as a morbid, degrading, and unhealthy interest in sex, as distinguished from a mere candid interest in sex. Two, whether the work depicts or describes in a patently offensive way sexual conduct specifically defined by the applicable state law. And third, whether the work taken as a whole lacks serious literary, artistic, political, or scientific value. So this is a conjunctive test. And if um, uh, it has to fail each and every one of these elements in order to be uh, deemed unprotected, obscene speech. In this case, the court proclaimed that, quote, there is no evidence, empirical or historical, 
that the stern 19th century American censorship of public distribution and display of material relating to sex in any way limited or affected expression of serious literary, artistic, political, or scientific ideas. One might question the truth of that claim, but uh, the Miller test also appears to shift the focus of uh, the, the community standards test, right? The appeal to purient interest and patent of offensiveness are both to be judged with reference to contemporary community standards. But notice community standards can be interpreted a couple of different ways. And here it seems to be interpreted as a majoritarian standard, most people in the community. And so by a, a, a commonality, but not necessarily by standards of um, um, an ideal situated judge. So notice if most people in the community have a temperature, blood temperature of 102, then that becomes the average standard temperature. But it's pathological, right? That's unhealthy. So it might just simply be that most people in the community are ill. Right? So majoritarian does not necessarily mean ideal. So for that reason, Justice Brennan strongly dissented, realizing uh, the repressive potential for such a standard, cashing out how ideal observers uh, is to be understood was shifting to community or majoritarian standards as opposed to those of a reasonable person. This then allows for a tyranny of the majority, while harm against women has often been cited as motivation for restrictions on pornography. Male gay images have largely been targeted by this approach. This suggests that discriminating against a reasonable minority, say the male gay, gay population, is not only possible, but altogether likely if what we're doing is majoritarian standards as opposed to uh, some sort of ideal standard grounded in um, rationality or something like that. Brennan goes in his dissent to go on to say, the outright suppression of obscenity cannot be reconciled with the fundamental principles of the first and 14th amendments. No definition of obscenity could ever be formulated with sufficient clarity that it would target only constitutionally unprotected speech. Experience has demonstrated that, according to Brennan, almost every obscenity case is marginal and presents a constitutional question of exceptional difficulty. But we may take this up again later when we do legal reasoning. But now on to beauty. As we shall see, judgments of beauty can be understood in each of the four ways addressed above. One might claim that a judgment of beauty is a statement about an objective feature of the beautiful object. It is a mind independent, it is mind independent, and if two people disagree as to whether or not an object is beautiful, at least one of them must be wrong. An alternative to this view is subjectivism, which holds that to claim that something is beautiful is nothing other than to report that one finds it visually pleasing. On this view, it's entirely possible for something to cause in me the beauty response, but not cause that in you. In this case, the object would be beautiful for me and not beautiful for you. Neither one of us has, uh, is right or wrong, since there is indeed no objective fact for us to be right or wrong about. The ideal observer account would suggest that to say an object is beautiful is to say that it is such as to provoke the beauty response in all or most suitably uh, sensitive ideal observers. Finally, the ideal observer plus context account would recognize that even ideal observers might disagree about whether or not an object is beautiful, depending on the context within which that observation occurs. So let's talk about objectivity with respect to beauty. That's actually the oldest notion of uh, judgments of beauty in Western traditions, right? In classical times in Western cultures, there was thought to be an affinity, if not an identity, among three concepts, truth, 
goodness and beauty. It's probably much larger than just Western culture, but that's the one I'm focusing on here. Notice uh, uh, in these cultures uh, Western, of Western history, um, heroic characters were generally presented as beautiful. The gods were considered to be beautiful. Even our own folk tales and myths, for example, would have the gods, except comic or monstrous gods, uh, be, being breathtakingly beautiful. Um, the evil witch was an ugly old crone. Good fairies were thought to be beautiful. Monsters were thought to be the result of moral corruption. Vampires are ugly. Once Buffy stakes them, that might be a culturally fading reference, but I like Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Um, so predating the philosopher Plato, there is a tradition of thinking of beauty, goodness, and truth as related signs of one another, or perhaps in some mystical way, these three are identical. Under the influence of Plato, classical philosophy meditated extensively on what it termed the transcendentals, specifically the true, the good, and the beautiful. Classical philosophy regarded these transcendentals as qualities of being as such. Truth is being as knowable. Goodness is being as lovable. And beauty is being as admirable, attractive, or desirable. Now, it is common for us today to think of truth as a property that applies only to propositions or sentences. That is, we think of sentences or propositions as true or false. But a more classical understanding of the adjective truth holds that it is a property which describes things. Things were thought to be true in the sense of a true friend or a true love, or a true blade, right? That friend is a true friend. Uh, what does that mean? Under this older understanding of truth, to say that a thing is true is to say that that thing approaches its own perfection as the sort of thing that it is, the sort of thing that it be. For instance, a true friend is a friend who exemplifies friendness or friendship most fully a friend who bees friendship to the extent that your friend is to the friend to the extent that your friend be a friend or be as a friend he exemplifies the ideal of friendship and the more fully he be a friend the more fully he exemplifies this ideal of friendship Thus, to the extent that something is true, it has a greater degree of reality, degree of being. Things are true to the extent that they be, and they be, exist, to the extent that they are true. But no further, this means that to, uh, uh, that to, ah, that, that to the very extent that they are unimpeded, let's try that again. But no further that to that very extent, that very same extent, they are unimpaired and thus beautiful and good. And I know I screwed it up, so we'll go through it one more time. To the extent that they be, they are true, but to that very same extent, they are unimpaired. And thus, to that very same extent, they are beautiful and they are good. Now, this is somewhat heavy metaphysical theorizing, but there may in fact be biological hardwiring for this tendency to identify the beautiful with the good and the true. Modern scientists have long documented what they call the halo effect. The halo effect occurs when a person, or for that matter, a product, uh, positive or negative traits spill over from one area to their of their personality or, or, or what have you, to others uh, in our perception of them. This can manifest in the fact that pretty people are thought to be more honest and ugly people are thought to be more devious and less trustworthy. The American psychologist, Edward Thorndike, for instance, documented that when soldiers were asked to rate their commanding officers, he found high cross-correlation between all positive and all negative traits. 
uh, the taller officers were thought to be better leaders than the shorter officer, officers were. And that there was, again, this, this um, uh, cross-coordination. People seem to rarely think uh, of each other in mixed terms. Instead, we seem to see individuals as universally good or roughly bad across all categories of measurement. Again, that's called the halo effect. So their beauty, their goodness, and their truthfulness. Another common example of the halo effect is that good-looking school children or good-looking persons versus more plain-looking persons are perceived to be more clever when they, even when they present no objective evidence of this. This has been shown in various studies where teachers perceive their uh, attractive students as being brighter and more clever than their less attractive students. Even when objectively there's no grounds for that judgment. In marketing, the halo effect is one where the perceived positive features of a particular item extend to the broader brand. This has been used to describe how originally the iPod and then later iPhones have had a positive effect on the perceptions of Apple's other products generally. This is related to another well-documented phenomenon called the beauty bias. We tend to pay more attention to good-looking people. Arizona State researcher Douglas Kendrick's uh, eye-tracking research has shown that both men and women spend more time looking at beautiful women. And when they say beautiful, they have in mind the cultural norm of beauty. Uh, then less attractive women. Babies as young as eight months will stare at unattractive female faces of any race longer than they will at average looking or unattractive female faces, again, at any rate. So, so notice a couple of things. Number one, the reason why the babies are significant is because that seems to suggest that this is too early uh, for cultural factors to have influenced their aesthetic preferences. So their aesthetic preferences seem to be biologically based if they're occurring this early on in the, uh, in the child's development. But then also notice this is further confirmed by the fact that racial differences don't seem to make much of a difference at this stage of uh, aesthetic preferencing. Later on, the, uh, the older one gets, they actually start to make a difference. So there seems to be some interplay between to what extent our aesthetic preferences are biologically based and to what extent our aesthetic preferences are culturally inherited. Uh, what cognitive scientists refer to as bottom up or to, oh, I'm doing a, vis a gesture you can't see, bottom up or top, top town, there we go, um, processing. Certain human traits seem to be universally recognized as beautiful, for instance, symmetry. And someone pointed out, I, I need to clarify that, bilateral symmetry, not radial symmetry. So if I had eyes in a circle all around my head, you might not find that very attractive, but bilateral symmetry. Uh, regularity in the shape and size of features, smooth skin, big eyes, actually widely set eyes are also considered um, uh, to be attractive, and thick lips, etc. Researchers, researchers suggest that men have evolved to select for these features as they are associated with health and reproductive fitness. Now, what they're not saying is that um, the, the, the uh, male says, oh, I'm going to pursue the bilaterally symmetric uh, face uh, because that's better breeding stock, right? Rather, they think that we've been biologically hardwired to prefer bilateral symmetry because those of our ancestors who did uh, ended up having more successful uh, um, reproductive uh, offspring than those who did not. And why? Well, because bilateral symmetry can be a sign of good genetic or um, healthy genetic um, structure. Right? Nancy Ekoff, uh, uh, author of Survival of the Prettiest, claimed that women's responses are more cognitively complex. She claimed that women stare at beautiful female faces out of aesthetic appreciation to look for potential tips, and also because a beautiful woman could be a rival worth monitoring. There are numerous studies that demonstrate that physical 
attractiveness affects our perception of the person's morality and truthfulness. While this operates largely at the unconscious level, we even have evidence of this happening at the nearly conscious level. Ted Bundy. Now, even as a young adult, had you asked me, do you think pretty people are more uh, moral than unattractive people, or that they're smarter and more capable it generally, of course I would have said, don't be absurd. No, right, I would have said that. And yet I remember years ago being in a bookstore one time, and I was looking at the cover of a paperback account of the life and crimes of the serial killer, Ted Bundy. And I recall staring at the photo of this very handsome man, and I was looking for the monster, confident that it had to be there someplace, and that if I just looked carefully enough, I could see the, the, the immorality, the evil of this individual, maybe in the eyes somehow. But why? I mean, again, I didn't consciously believe that there was a direct connection between physical attractiveness and moral goodness. And yet somehow there I was looking for the monster. Maybe because there's something contradictory about a beautiful evil or a beautiful ugliness. All this to say that not only has there been some cultural conceptual link between beauty, truth, and moral goodness, there may even be some sort of biological explanation for this. So Plato formalized the notion common to many, if not all cultures, that beauty was tied to truth and goodness. Much of Platonic philosophy deals with distinguishing between appearance and reality. And just as not everything that appears to be true is true, and not everything that appears to be good is in fact good, so too for Plato and those who follow him on this, not everything that appears to be beautiful is beautiful. For Plato then, beauty is divorced from appearance. That something has a pleasant appearance tells you nothing about whether or not it is beautiful, at least strictly speaking for Plato. Beauty doesn't equal pleasant appearing. Uh, in, the, in the Middle Ages, there arose the notion of a glamour. Of course, now glamour is a trashy magazine, I suppose, but uh, a glamour was something which had a veneer, a pleasing veneer, but it concealed evil or ugliness or immorality. Right? And we, we were to be put on guard. It's a very platonic idea. Oops. Plato makes a point, uh, a similar point about goodness. He knows that every, not everything that tastes good is good for you. Right? There's an important difference between the cook who wants to please your palate and the dietitian who wants you to be healthy. Again, the beautician who wants to uh, perhaps make you appear lovely, uh, healthy, um, vital, and the physical therapist who wants to make you healthy. His view, Plato's that is, on beauty is importantly different from the view that most people have today that beauty just means what is visually pleasing to me, right? the sensuously agreeable. That's not his notion of beauty. For Plato, the wise person must distinguish between apparent truth and real truth, apparent goodness and real goodness, and apparent beauty, glamour, and real beauty. Hence the branches of philosophy, epistemology to deal with truth, ethics to deal with goodness, and aesthetics to deal with beauty. As, whoops, oh, sorry about that. Yes. Now, um, what uh, two kinds of beautiful things? Plato noted that simple things can be beautiful, pure tones and single beautiful colors, uh, and complex things can be beautiful. Simple things have unity because they are simple, and complex things have measure and proportion of parts by means of which they achieve a kind of unity a unity in difference. And lots of estheticians after Plato really capitalized on this idea that beautiful things have this um, quality of unity in difference. Right? 
Uh, you still have people who talk about paintings, what unifies the painting, or novels, what unifies the novels, or poems, or pieces of music, etc. But Plato does not mean to identify beauty with unity. It's simply a discoverable fact, allegedly, that beautiful things are unified. Instead, Plato seems to believe that beauty is a simple, unanalyzable property, which means um, uh, that the term cannot be defined at all, and that we simply learn it by direct experience. We kind of intuit beauty. Nevertheless, his emphasis on measure and proportion set an important precedent for all subsequent philosophers. Some theorists thought of, uh, after Plato now, some theorists thought of beauty as an object that does not exist in the world of sense at all, the Neoplatonists, and that beautiful things are beautiful because they're sort of channeling the beauty, right? That the, the beauty is in transcendent form and, and, and it's piercing through or, or, or it's viewable through the lens of these objects. And that's why we find them beautiful. Um, others identify beauty with measure and proportion, which we find in our sensuous experience. Another important result of the theory of Plato is the establishment of the notion of contemplation as a central idea in a theory of beauty and consequently in the theory of aesthetic experience. This is a kind of meditation that brings about an awareness of some non-sensuous entity. Likewise, it is the notion that beauty brings to us a kind of awareness of objective truth. So we, we adopt this sort of um, uh, meditative mindset in order to genuinely appreciate beauty uh, or in the presence of things of great beauty. Thus, for those following the Platonic tradition, the beauty experience is a kind of cognition or an intelligence or a rational order. This is um, very different from the merely pleasurable, effective response, again, the sensuously agreeable. So you're saying, no, it's not this affective response, it's this cognitive response that one is in the presence of something of value, right? This beautiful thing. Something of the platonic sense of contemplation remains in modern aesthetic theories. American philosopher George Dickey argued that this is responsible for the solemn and what he thought was a pompous attitude towards art and beauty that some persons display. Dickey points out that many of our experiences with art and nature are not contemplative in Plato's sense. So he thought this very notion of the platonic notion of contemplation was wrongheaded and that uh, we might enjoy beautiful things and ha not in this sort of solemn and uh, reverential way. For what it's worth, I don't agree with Dickey here, which no doubt used to keep him up at night. No, I don't think he could care less. But for what it's worth, I think the solemnity uh, that we adopt in the presence of things of great beauty arises from the conviction that we are in the presence of something of real value. This conviction I take to be an integral part of the beauty sublime experience, a sort of phenomenological uh, uh, experience to which it invokes this emotional response. But we can talk about that another day. So then we have this tradition that beauty names a real mind independent property of things. And if two people disagree as to whether something is beautiful or not, or to what degree it is beautiful, they cannot both be correct. This is an objectivist account of beauty, hung, and it hung on for quite some time. Eventually, it lost grounds to its ancient rival, subjectivism. The view, and again, it is an ancient rival. It has very ancient roots. The uh, Latin saying, de gustibus no non disputandum est, there is no accounting for taste, right? That, <laughs> that beauty is a sort of subjective response. But again, that was a long time coming. Right? As late as the 15th century, you would find plenty of advocates of the roughly platonic view of beauty with its quasi-religious and metaphysical significance. The Italian Neoplatonist philosopher uh, Ficchino um, translated the works of Plato and Plotinus, making them accessible during the Renaissance, was fascinated with classical mythology and magic, 
promoted a synthesis of Neoplatonic thought with the doctrines of Christianity. And for Ficino, the visual arts were especially important. Their function was to remind the soul of its origin in the divine world by creating, through art, resemblances of that divine world. Ficino's insistence on the importance of this with respect to painting has been credited with raising the status of the painter in Florentine society to nearer the poet rather than the carpenter or the craftsman where it had been previously. So he says, oh no, the, the, the painter is doing almost this religious divine work of um, uh, conferring with the divine entities and allowing them to mediate through their paintings and through their works. Quoting Ficino, Plato asserted that in all things there is one truth that is the light of the one itself, the light of deity, which is poured into the minds and forms, presenting the forms to the minds and joining to the minds to the forms. Whoever wishes to profess the study of Plato should therefore honor the one truth, which is the single ray of the one divinity. I have it in the notes, I won't read it all here. But notice, he's basically saying um, uh, that the splendor that we see in the world, the beauty that we see in the world is a testament to the divine one. It is worth noting that Sandro Botticelli, uh, the, the, the painter, sculptor, etc., um, knew and was influenced by the aesthetic theories of Ficino. With this philosophy in mind, Bot Botticelli's pagan gods are seen in a new sanctified context. The pagan gods are representations of the ideals of Christianity. Thus, Ficino seemed to offer a perfect solution to the dilemma of the Renaissance which is how to find a sanctified place for the art and aesthetic values of the pre-Christian classical world. Botticelli's works embody the spirit of the Renaissance. By this point in Western history, traditional medieval Christianity with its renunciation of worldly pleasures and interests and concerns had lost much of its appeal, perhaps due in part to the disappointment of the first millennium, Christ didn't come back, um, and the later Crusades. The ancient pagan ideals of beauty and the good life began to reassert themselves during this time. Consider Primavera. Uh, this is a thoroughly pagan picture, an exuberant revival of embodied natural forces and an era of total control in the era of total control by the church. The style is reminiscent of classical styles of art, similar to the Roman frescoes. Um, Botticelli is permitted to paint such images with previous um, art, uh, artists, previous artists would not have been because of Ficino's theology and philosophy. Ficino argued that celestial Venus and the Virgin Mary were expressions of divine love. He spoke of emanations of or from God to the noetic world. With this philosophy in mind, Botticelli's pagan gods were seen in a new sanctified context. Again, the pagan gods were representations of this, the ideals of Christianity, again, solving the dilemma of the Renaissance. So the two images on the left-hand side are actual ancient Roman frescoes. The image on the right is Primavera by Botticelli. Again, a thoroughly pagan uh, painting uh, in the sense of celebrating pre-Christian aesthetics and pre-Christian naturalism. But according to the um, theology and philosophy of Ficino, all of them are expressions of beauty, which is divine love and God. The analysis of beauty furnished by the, oh, moving on though, right? Theory of beauty, 18th and 19th centuries. The analysis of beauty furnished by the 18th century philosophers of taste shifts the basis for objective judgments of beauty. Such judgments or experiences are now attributed to alleged faculty or faculties of which individuals react to certain features in the objective world. The theories of beauty that arose at this time reflected and were influenced by the intellectual trends of this period, 
principally modern philosophy and modern science's rejection of the classical worldview, the worldview of Plato and Aristotle and of the medievals. Let's get scientific. This is practically the motto of the Enlightenment. If they had t-shirts in those days, they'd all be wearing this slogan across the front and on the back it would say, there's got to be a rational explanation. With this mindset, what do we imagine is going on when we see something beautiful? Again, from this perspective, what seriously does it mean when I judge something to be beautiful? That it participates in the transcendent platonic form of beauty? I don't think so. The classical worldview that beauty names an undefinable and transcendent concept or form was simply unacceptable and far too mystical to the British philosophers who were committed to empiricism and science and empirical investigations, etc. So around this time, Alexander Baumgarten coined the term aesthetics and conceived of aesthetics as the science of sensory cognition. He exploited the medieval tradition of explaining a behavior and mental phenomenon by attributing, uh, attributing each <laughs> kind of phenomenon to a distinct faculty of mind. Baumgarten's basic view, and those who followed him in this, is that our minds have the capacity to be stimulated to have a beauty experience. In a way, it was kind of like salty taste. When I taste something salty, my tongue has been stimulated by a physical, formal structure in the world, the shape of the sodium uh, chloride molecule. And this, is, uh, and in a particular way, this it causes in me a sensory effect. The apparatus of taste uh, could be conceived of in three different ways. First, uh, the apparatus of taste might be conceived of a single unique faculty, right? The beauty faculty or sense of beauty. Alternatively, one might conceive of the apparatus of taste as several special faculties, a sense of beauty for beauty experience, a sense of the sublime for sublime experience. So given different aesthetic experiences, there might be distinct uh, faculties. Or the apparatus of taste might simply be ordinary cognitive and affective faculties functioning in an unusual and unique way. So, for instance, Edmund Burke had suggested that the sublime experience is provoked in us when our cognitive faculties are stimulated to acknowledge we are in the presence of something which is otherwise dangerous, would be threatening, but we're perceiving it from the point of view of relative safety. So, if I'm looking at the crashing waves of a, of, a, of a raging storm at sea, but I'm perceiving it from the, the, the relative safety of my, um, my uh, beachfront uh, house, um, I might find that pleasing, that sublime experience, right? Anyway, so notice that would be the case of organative, co ordinary cognitive faculties, uh, but um, being deployed in an unusual way. A host of theories of taste accounts arose during this period, but we're not going to look at all of them. We're only going to look at one in a little bit of detail because it's an ideal observer theory of beauty, and we've already looked at this in, in a bit. Right? And so this is the theory of David Hume. Though it be certain that beauty and deformity, more than sweet and bitter, are not qualities in objects, but belong entirely to sentiment, internal or external, it must be allowed that there are certain qualities and objects which are fitted by nature to produce those particular feelings. So notice it's an ideal observer theory. He wants to say that um, beauty and deformity name a quality of our experience, something subjective, internal to a certain extent. Nevertheless, it is real, um, reliably provoked by certain features of nature. So according to Hume, beauty and its opposite, deformity, are not objects, but are feelings linked 
by the nature of our human constitutions to certain qualities in objects. Like an earlier esthetician, uh, Francis Hutchinson, uh, an other faculty of taste theorist, Hume blends subjective and objective elements into his account of where beauty judgments come from. Objective judgments about what is and is not beautiful are possible on Hume's account, but these judgments are judgments about what is such as to elicit universal agreement among normal competent subjects under ideal conditions of perception. So when I say blah, blah, blah is beautiful, I'm saying blah, blah, blah is such as to elicit um, universal agreement among normal competent subjects under ideal conditions of perception. So I'm talking about the subjective reactions of a certain class of observing uh, observers under a certain set of conditions in reaction to the object. These are stable and predictable because they are based in certain alleged objective features of the world and stabilities in human nature and human perception. Because Hume refers to these judgments, uh, to rather, because Hume refers to the judgments of ideal judges, his theory is not a mere subjectivism about beauty judgments, but rather something more objective. Beauty judgments are empirical predictions about the responses of normal perceivers under ideal conditions. Hume suggests that certain qualities in objects that cause pleasure. Oh, Hume suggested that there are certain qualities in objects that cause pleasure. But unlike the earlier theorist Hutchinson, Hume does not try to reduce it to a single formula. Hutchinson had uniformity and variety. Um, uh, Hume doesn't try to come up with a single formula. And unlike Edmund Burke, Hume does not try to specify a complete short list of beauty making qualities. Rather, Hume mentions in passing some 20 or so beauty making qualities, uniformity, variety, luster and color, clearness of expression, exactness and imitation, he goes on. And he doesn't seem to think that he's hit them all. He's just saying, here are some beauty making qualities. Um, but he does allow for variation in taste. Now these variations though, he, think, uh, he thinks are going to be due not to um, uh, aberrations or uh, defects in the perceiving uh, judges, their ideal judges, but due to age, right? He claims that young men prefer amorous and tender images, whereas older men prefer wise philosophical reflections, et cetera. But since the, aber the differences are due to these uh, differences in age rather than aberrations in the perceiver, no standard of taste exists to rate one preference as better than the other. So he isn't suggesting that the aesthetic preferences of young men are, are preferable to the aesthetic preferences of older or vice versa. Hence, there's an irreducible relativism in Hume's realism. Nevertheless, to say that something is beautiful is to make an objective empirical prediction about it. Specifically, it is to claim that all or most suitably situated ideal judges would find the thing pleasing. Now, either these ideal judges would find it pleasing and thus one's judgment is correct, or they would not and thus one judge, one's judgment is incorrect. But what makes one's judgment correct or incorrect is not one's own subjective feeling, but rather the accuracy of the empirical prediction. Initially, these theories suggested that there were certain objective features of the world which would trigger the beauty experience. So long as this is the picture of aesthetic experience, then aesthetic experience is keying us into some objective feature of the world. And one could reasonably claim not only that some things are beautiful and some things are not, but that these are objectively true judgments just as in a similar way, we might say that it is an objective truth that seawater tastes salty. And since the taste of salt does tell us something that is likely to be objectively true about the chemical that's on our tongue, it does inform us. So the taste of salt does inform us about what we're in the presence of, let's say, sodium chloride. And similarly, 
the beauty experience does inform us that we are in the presence of some um, set of beauty making or beauty provoking objective qualities. But note, if I taste sweet, I might be in the presence of sucrose or fructose, or for that matter, saccharin or aspartame. So sweet taste gives us a sort of disjunctive information. The question then becomes what specific objective features of the world provoke the beauty experience? So I say, well, this is telling me something objective about the world. What? What is it telling you? What are those objective features that reliably, predictably, universally provoke the beauty experience in the set of ideal judges? Note further that those objective features, which generally provoke certain subjective experiences, say like sodium chloride for salty taste, can be overridden by faulty sensory systems, which may differ from perceiver to perceiver. So even on this quasi-objectivist account of beauty, the potential arises for subjectivism or radical relativism with respect to beauty judgments. As the theories articulated themselves over the centuries, judgments of beauty were seen to be less and less objective and thus less and less informative. So the three main reasons for this um, sort of demise for the seriousness and objectivity of judgments of beauty, number one, the objective features which account for beauty seemed rather elusive. Number two, close attention to beauty seems to splinter into many aesthetic qualities which are distinct. And if they're distinct, they may not have a single set of objective qualities that provoke them. It might be multiple qualities that provoke these multiple kinds of experiences. And third, there was an evolution to what was called the association of ideas theories, which made beauty less and less informative. As association of idea theories started to assert themselves, they were suggesting that it is some psychological association which provokes in us the beauty experience. And with the right associations, any object can provoke the beauty experience regardless of its formal qualities. If that's the case, that having the beauty experience tells us nothing about the object before us, but merely about the psychological associations that we have for that object. Number one, we're going to do each of those three in a little more detail now. Theorists of taste attempted to specify objective features that to uh, evoke the experience of beauty, but neither a reliable nor comprehensive list of features could ever be specified, nor a reliable formula could be found. So they gave their best. They couldn't seem to come up with one. Well, I did it again. There we go. In addition, the more precise we sought to get about uh, to get about what is a beauty experience and what it consists in, the concept became in exceedingly diffuse. So beauty seems to be actually distinct from sublime, which seems to be distinct from pretty, which seems to be distinct from picturesque. So I might think of a rose as beautiful, but I might think of a daisy as pretty or charming. But now if we're, if there's all these different aesthetic experiences, well, then there would have to be different faculties and different objective qualities, and it becomes rather difficult uh, to, uh, to catalog all of that. Initially, these various differences between the kinds of experiences were papered over with terms such as aesthetic experience. Well, we'll just call them aesthetic experience. Nevertheless, they do reflect a diverse set of experiences. This is, then suggests that there is no one set of objective conditions or formal features which explain them all. And then finally, there was a drift away from these theories which conceive of the apparatus of taste as a single set sense or a set of special senses specifically related to certain kinds of uh, objects. And there arose the associationist theories, which that began um, to appear where the mechanism is an association of ideas. And this is what provides the means for indefinitely extending the range of things which might be judged 
beautiful. Thus, the traditional way of defining by looking at all the things denoted by the term and finding something common to all becomes impossible. In the case of beauty, since anything, or nearly so, could be a member of the set of beautiful objects, provided that it had the right psychological associations. This situation is similar to that um, of the present day aesthetic attitude theorists that maintain that anything can be aesthetic if only experienced while in the aesthetic attitude. In other words, if one puts uh, oneself in the right frame of mind and adopts the aesthetic attitude, one then undergoes an aesthetic experience. Well, if that's the case, then you're telling me much more about the attitude you, you're adopting or the mindset you're in than you are telling me about the objective features of the world you're attending to. Any aspect of the material world may become associated with a quality of mind and evoke the simple emotion responsible for the beauty experience. Thus, any aspect of the material world can be become beautiful, even the ugly ones. This um, is because it is not the object's perceptible qualities that cause them to be beautiful, but rather their associations. Such an account appears to provide a cognitive basis for explaining the richness and complexity of the experience of art and nature. However, it amounts to the claim that anything in the material world can be beautiful if it has the right associations, and thus a judgment of beauty tells us nothing remotely objective and does not inform us at all. So we went from the early days of faculty of taste theory that perhaps judgments of beauty is telling us something objective, is informing us to, by the end of this period, uh, the view that it tells us nothing objective and doesn't inform us at all. So faculty of taste theories sort of lost their taste for faculties of taste, ha ha. Uh, faculty of taste philosophies subjectivized beauty, but only partially. Each claimed that some specific feature of the objective world triggered the faculty of taste. But by the end, associationist theories, by contrast, place the lion's share of the responsibility for beauty experience on the viewer. By the uh, 19th century, you have the philosopher um, Arthur Schopenhauer, who basically was claiming that to say a thing is beautiful is simply to say it's the object of one's aesthetic contemplation. And he claimed that there was no objective criterion whatsoever to saying that something is beautiful. Schopenhauer notwithstanding. So let's reconsider this. But there may be limits as to what we can reasonably find to be beautiful. There might be things which are just obscene and there's no way we can find them beautiful. Or nauseating, in which case we cannot find them beautiful. Thus, any aspect of the material uh, 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 Schopenhauer would have us believe that any aspect of the material world can be uh, can become beautiful, even the ugly world. Um, but this amounts to claiming that the only difference between the beauty of a parrot and the beauty of a turkey vulture is how I'm processing the experience. But that seems, that seems unreasonable. Right? This may be going too far. After all, some objects are more or uh, readily seen as beautiful. It doesn't take very much for me to see the beauty of a parrot. Uh, that's why they make keychains and posters, right? It does take some doing to see the beauty of a, a turkey vulture. So likewise, it takes a lot of work to see the beauty of a possum. Mm. Less so a cat. Mm. <laughs> so I might be able to regestalt that possum and find it beautiful, but it's a lot easier to gestalt the cat. There's some very interesting work being done now that suggests Hume or something like the ideal observer theory was basically right. It suggests that we are biologically hardwired to react positively to certain uh, or negatively to certain visual stimulation. And we anticipated some of this earlier when we were talking about um, uh, young children and uh, aesthetic preferences in terms of faces, etc. For instance, uh, 
V.S. Ramachandran and William Hurstein. I've written a paper, it's a little dated now, suggested a neurological explanation for art that we find visually compelling and uh, attractive. We won't go into the details here. Our visual system is designed in large part to make coherent experience out of a world of noise. Our very survival depends on doing so in a way that allows us to navigate and otherwise interface with the world. In visual cognition, this requires binding certain features of perception together and not others. Success in making visual sense out of the world of our visual field is sort of like solving a visual puzzle. And that itself is rewarding and a pleasant experience. Nature has made it so in order to keep us doing it. So what their line of research suggests is that we have been biologically hardwired to try to find um, visual coherence and to make uh, visual sense out of what otherwise would be uh, dissonance, visual dissonance or visual noise. Notice how some, some web pages just yield to being understood more easily than others. And the ones we find confusing, we find ugly and annoying. And those we find simple and elegant are the ones we simply can navigate well. Well, that's because some ways of organizing our visual field is more readily metabolized, more readily understood by us. Again, there are certain formal structures which provoke in us that pleasant feeling because it allows us to solve the visual puzzle more easily. Thus, while beauty names an idea raised in us, that's what Francis Hutchinson had said, as a faculty of taste theorist Hutchinson had said, owing to our biolog biological similarities, we should expect and do observe broad convergence of judgments among normal, informed, and unbiased human perceivers. So this does seem to suggest that something like what Hutchinson and Hume and the other early faculty of uh, taste theorists were on about were correct. This explanation also coheres with research on face and body attractiveness. This view can also make good sense of the role of syntax in music composition and appreciation as well. So for instance, certain musical compositions yield and we find them beautiful because we find them um, uh, orderly and we can sort of see the intelligence and the beauty and the structure there. Nevertheless, a comprehensive science of beauty of art, uh, try that again. Nevertheless, a comprehensive science of beauty and art does not appear to be in the offing. Daunting questions bedevil any such research attempt. What precisely is the beauty experience? Remember it fractured when you start looking at it in close detail. There's a large gap between having galvanic skin responses and aesthetic enjoyment. It seems that our um, behaviorist researchers are easily tracking the one, but that may not translate into tracking the other. Who are the ideal observers? This is a problem for anyone who wants to evoke an ideal observer account of anything, including notions of art and beauty. What we see is not just the result of bottom-up biological processing, but also, to a surprising degree, the result of top-down cultural priming and expectations. Sorting all of this out is rather difficult. What of our aesthetic preferences owe to our, our biology, and what of our aesthetic preferences owe to our cultural inheritance? And if we are, in some respect, programmed to find some things more pleasing than others, is that in and of itself reason to think we should. Kant seems to talk about a, an oughtness to judgments of beauty. All this would be telling us is thatness. We happen to find these things pleasing. That wouldn't necessarily establish that they ought to please us. As Plato cautioned us so long ago, maybe we should not mistake glamour for beauty. Maybe it's worth reconsidering whether real beauty is always apparently beautiful. All right, well, that concludes my remarks on judgments of beauty. Hopefully, you found some of these interesting, maybe, maybe stimulating to some extent. Naturally, if you have questions, please reach out to me. 
uh, and uh, and I'd be only too happy to discuss them with you, or maybe you have insights of your own you'd like to share. Anyway, I wish you well. Thank you for your attention.